chapter three of the forbidden way by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva new york wonderful things happened in the year which followed the lone tree was a bonanza every month added to the value of the discovery the incredulous came saw and were conquered and mesa city was a boom town again jeff ray hadn't a great deal to say in those days his brain was working overtime upon the great interlocking scheme of financial enterprises which was to make him one of the richest men in the west he spoke little but his face wore a smile that never came off and his baby blue stare was more vacuous than ever and yet as month followed month and the things happened which he had so long predicted for himself and for the town something of his old arrogance slipped away from him if balked ambition and injured pride had made him boast before it was success that tamed him there was no time to swagger weighty problems gave him an air of seriousness which lent him a dignity he had never possessed and if sometimes he blustered now people listened there was a difference as the time for her wedding approached for the first time in her life camilla felt the personality of the man why was it that she could not love him since that hour at the schoolhouse when cortland bent had shown her how near and how fearful could be the spiritual relation between a woman and a man life had taken a different meaning to her jeff's was a curious courtship he made love to her bunglingly and she realized that his diffidence was the expression of a kind of rustic humility which set her in a shrine at which he distantly worshipped he seemed most like the jeff of other days when he was talking of himself and she allowed him to do this by the hour listening questioning and encouraging if this was to make the most of her life perhaps it might be as well to get used to the idea she could not deny that she was interested jeff's schemes seemed like a page out of a fairy book and whether she would or not she went along with him there seemed no limit to his invention and there was little doubt in his mind or indeed in hers that the world was to be made to provide very generously for them both it was on the eve of their wedding day that jeff first spoke of his childhood i suppose you know camilla i never had a father that is he corrected not one to brag about my mother was a waitress in the frontier hotel at fort dodge she died when i was born that's my family tree you knew it i guess but i thought maybe you'd like to change your mind he looked away from her the words came slowly and there was a note of heaviness in his voice she realized how hard it was for him to speak of these things and put her hand confidently in his yes i knew she said softly but i never weighed that against you jeff it only makes me prouder of what you have become and then after a pause did you never hear anything about him there were some letters written before i was born i'll show them to you some day he was from new york uh, that's all i know maybe you can guess now why i didn't like court bent camilla withdrew her hands from his and buried her face in them while ray sat gloomily gazing at the opposite wall in a moment she raised her head her cheeks burning yes i understand now she muttered he was not worth bothering about 
and now they were at the hotel in new york where jeff had come on business the empire drawing-room overlooked fifth avenue and the cross street there was a reception room in the french style a dining-room in english oak a library flemish smoking-room turkish a hall dutch and a number of bedrooms each a reproduction of a celebrated historical apartment the wall hangings were of silk the curtains of heavy brocade the pictures poor copies of excellent old masters the rugs costly and the fixtures in camilla's bathroom were of solid silver camilla stood before the cheval glass in her dressing-room trying on with the assistance of her maid and a modiste a fetching hat and afternoon costume chairs tables and the bed in her own sleeping-room were covered with miscellaneous finery when the women had gone camilla dropped into a chair in the drawing-room there was something about the made-to-order magnificence which oppressed her with its emptiness everything that money could buy was hers for the asking her husband was going to be fabulously wealthy every month since they had been married had developed new possibilities his foresight was extraordinary and his luck had become a byword in the west each of his new ventures had attracted a large following and money had flowed into the coffers of the company it was difficult for her to realize all that had happened in the wonderful period since she had sat at her humble desk in the schoolhouse at mesa city she was not sure what it was that she lacked for she and jeff got along admirably but the room in which she sat seemed to be one expression of it a room to be possessed but not enjoyed their good fortune was so brief that it had no perspective life had no personality it was made of things like the articles in this drawing-room each one agreeably harmonious with the other but devoid of associations pleasant or unpleasant the only difference between this room and the parlor at mrs brennan's was that the furniture of the hotel had cost more money to tell the truth camilla was horribly bored she had proposed to spend the mornings when jeff was downtown in the agreeable task of providing herself with a suitable wardrobe but she found that the time hung heavily on her hands the wives of jeff's business associates in new york had not yet called perhaps they never would call everything here spoke of wealth and the entrance of a new millionaire upon the scene was not such a rare occurrence as to excite unusual comment she peered out up the avenue at the endless tide of wealth and fashion which passed her by and she felt very dreary and isolated like a vacant house from which old tenants had departed and into which new ones would not enter she was in this mood when a servant entered she had reached the point when even this interruption was welcome but when she saw that the man bore a card tray her interest revived and she took up the bit of pasteboard with a short sigh of relief she looked at it turned it over in her fingers her blood slowing a little then rushing hotly to her temples cortland bent she let the card fall on the table beside her tell him that i am not she paused and glanced out of the window the quick impulse was gone tell him to come up she finished when the page disappeared she glanced about the room then hurried to the door to recall him but he had turned the corner into the corridor outside and the message was on its way to a lower floor she paused irresolute then went in again closing the outside door behind her what had she done a message of welcome to cortland bent 
the one person in the world she had promised herself she should never see again her husband's enemy her own because he was her husband's her own too because he had given her pride a wound from which it had not yet recovered what should she do she moved toward the door leading to her dressing-room to pause again what did it matter after all jeff wouldn't care she laughed why should he he could afford to be generous with the man who had lost the fortune he now possessed he had too an implicit confidence in her own judgment and never since they had been married had he questioned an action or motive of hers as for herself that was another matter she tossed her head and looked at herself in her mirror should she not even welcome the opportunity to show bent how small a place he now held in her memory the mirror told her she was handsome but she still lingered before it arranging her hair when her visitor was announced he stood with his hands behind his back studying the portrait over the fireplace turning at the sound of her voice it's very nice of you to see me he said slowly how long have you been here a few weeks only won't you sit down a warm color had come to her cheeks as she realized that he was carefully scrutinizing her from head to heel of course we're very much honored she began i can't tell you how glad i am to see you he broke in warmly i was tempted to write you a dozen times but your engagement and marriage to ray and he paused the trouble about the mine seemed to make it difficult somehow i'm sure my husband bears you no ill will he gave a short laugh there's no reason why he should there's nothing for him to be upset about he got the fortune that should which might have been mine to say nothing of the girl perhaps we had better leave the girl out of it she put in calmly even time hasn't explained that misunderstanding he shrugged a shoulder expressively as you please i'll not parade any ghosts if i can help it i'm too happy to see you you're more wonderful than ever really i don't believe i should have known you you're changed somehow i wonder what it is prosperity she suggested i'm not sure i feel at home with you you're so matured so so punctilious and modish you wouldn't have me wear a short skirt and a sombrero she said with a slow smile no no it is not what you wear so much as what you are you are really the great lady i think i knew it there in the west she glanced around the room this she queried this was jeff's idea and then as the possible disloyalty occurred to her you know i would much have preferred a quieter place fine feathers don't always make fine birds but fine birds can be no less fine whatever they wear there was a pause and then he asked how long will you be here all winter i think my husband has business in new york yes i know mesa city can spare him best at this season bent took up an ivory paper cutter from the table and sat turning it over in his fingers i hope i really hope we may be friends mrs ray i think perhaps if you'll let me i can be of service to you here i don't think that there is a chance that i can forget your husband's getting the lone tree away from me it's pretty hard to have a success like that at the tip of one's fingers and not be able to grasp it i've been pretty sick about it and the governor threatened to disown me but he seems to have taken a fancy to your husband i believe that they may have some business relations the fifty thousand dollars we got in the final settlement salved his wounds i think your husband has the law on his side and that's all there is to it i'm glad he has it for your sake though 
especially as it has given me a chance to see you again you're very generous she said i'm sorry it has worried me a great deal oh well let's say no more about it he said more cheerfully i'm so glad that you're to be here what do you think of my little burg does it amuse you at all what have you met many people or don't you want to meet them i'd like you to know my family my aunt mrs rumson especially she's a bit of a grenadier but i know you'll get along she always says what she thinks so you mustn't mind she's quite the thing here makes out people's lists for them and all that kind of thing won't you come and dine with the governor some time perhaps it will be time enough when we're asked oh uh, of course i forgot i'll ask gladys that's my sister to call at once please don't trouble try as she might to present an air of indifference down in her heart she was secretly delighted at his candid friendly attitude no other could have so effectually salved the sudden searing wound he had once inflicted to-day it was difficult to believe him capable of evil he had tried to forget the past why should not she there was another girl perhaps their engagement had been announced she knew she was treading on dangerous ground but she ventured to ask him gretchen he replied oh lord no not yet you see she has some ideas of her own on the subject and it takes at least two to make a bargain miss janey is a fine sport life is a good deal of a joke with her as it is to me but neither of us feels like carrying it as far as matrimony we get on beautifully she's frightfully rich i suppose i'll be too some day what's the use it's a sheer waste of raw material she has a romantic sort of an idea that she wants a poor man the sort of chap she can lift out of a gray atmosphere and i his voice grew suddenly sober you won't believe that i too had the same kind of notion it was some moments before she understood what he meant but the silence which followed was expressive he did not choose that she should misunderstand yes he added i mean you she laughed nervously you didn't ask me to marry you no but i might have explained why i didn't if you had given me time i don't think i realized what it meant to me to leave you until i learned that i had to perhaps it isn't too late to tell you now she was silent and so he went on i was engaged to be married i have been since i was a boy it was a family affair both of us protested but my father and hers had set their hearts on it my governor swore he'd cut me off unless i did as he wished and he's not a man to break his word i was afraid of him i was weak camilla i'm not ashamed to tell you the truth i knew unless i made good at the mine that i should have nothing to offer you so i thought if i could get you to come east stay for a while and meet my father that time might work out our salvation she got up hurriedly and walked to the window i can't see that you can do any good telling me this it means so little she stammered only to justify myself i want to try and make it possible for you to understand how things were with me then how they are now no no it can do no good let me finish he said calmly it was the other girl i was thinking about i was still pledged to her i could have written her for my release but matters came to a crisis rather suddenly and then you told me of your engagement to mr ray you see after that i didn't care what happened he paused leaning with one hand on the table his head bent perhaps i ought not to speak to you in this way now but it was on your own account i don't know what i said to you i only remember that i did not ask you to marry me but that i wanted you with me always his voice sounded very far away to camilla like a message from another life she had lived so long ago that it seemed almost 
a message from the dead she did not know whether what she most felt was happiness or misery the one thing she was sure of was that he had no right to be speaking to her in this way and that she had no right to be listening but still she listened his words sank almost to a whisper but she heard i wanted you to be with me always i knew afterwards that i had never loved any woman but you god help me that i never could love any other woman he stopped again in her corner camilla was crying softly tears of pity for him for the ashes of their dead don't dear he said gently she thought he was coming forward and raised her head to protest but she saw that he still stood by the table his back toward her she turned one look of mute appeal which he did not see in his direction and then rose quickly you must never speak in this way again she said with a surer note never i should not have listened it is my fault but i have been so so glad to hear that you didn't mean what you said god knows i forgive you and i only hope you can understand how it was with me you had been so friendly so clean it wounded me horribly it made me lose my faith in all things and i wanted to keep you as a friend i think i may still be a friend i hope so she emerged diffidently and laid her hand gently on his arm if you want to be my friend you must forget i'll try i have tried that was easier this morning than it is this afternoon it will be harder to-night harder still to-morrow he gave a short laugh and turned away from her toward the fireplace where he stood watching the gray embers oh people don't die of this sort of thing he muttered it was almost with an air of unconcern that she began rearranging the beauties on the table speaking with such a genuine spirit of raillery that he turned to look at her oh it isn't nearly as bad as you think it is a man is never quite so madly in love that he can't forget you've been dreaming i was different from the sort of girls you were used to you were in love with the mountains and mistook me for background no there wasn't any background he broke in there was never anything in the picture but you i know it's the same now Shh. i must not let you speak to me so if you do i must go away from new york or you must you wouldn't care she could make no reply to that and attempted none when the flowers were arranged she sat on the edge of the table facing him perhaps it would be the better way for me to go back to the west she said but new york is surely big enough to hold us both without danger of your meeting me too often and i have another idea her smile came slowly with difficulty when you see enough of me in your own city you'll be glad to forget me whether you want to or not perhaps you may meet me among your own kind of people your own kind of girls at dinners or at dances you don't really know me very well after all wouldn't it bother you if from sheer awkwardness i spilled my wine or said yes ma'am or no ma'am to my hostess not because i wanted to but because i was too frightened to think of anything else or mistook the butler for my host or stepped on somebody's toes in a ballroom you know i don't dance very well suppose oh what's the use camilla he broke in angrily you don't deceive anybody you know that kind of thing wouldn't make any difference to me but it might to other people you wouldn't fancy seeing me ridiculous he turned to the fire again and she perceived that her warning hadn't merited the dignity of a reply but her attitude and the lighter key in which her tone was pitched had saved the situation when he spoke again all trace of his discomposure had vanished oh i suppose i'll survive i've got a name for nerve of a certain kind and nobody shall say i ran away from a woman 
i don't suppose there's any use of my trying to like your husband you see i'm frank with you but i'll swallow a good deal to be able to be near you there was a silence during which she keenly searched his face you mustn't dislike jeff i can't permit that you can't blame him for being lucky lucky yes i suppose you might call it luck didn't you know how your husband and mulrennan got that mine she rose her eyes full of a new wonder and curiosity they leased it everything was legally done she said oh yes legally he paused go on go on what is the use i must know everything he never told you i think i know why because your code and his are different the consciences of some men are satisfied if they keep their affairs within the letter of the law but there's a moral law which has nothing to do with the courts he didn't tell you because he knew you obeyed a different precept what did he do won't you tell me End of chapter three